Domain expansions are advanced barrier techniques which are considered to be the peak of Jujutsu sorcery. It allows a user to convert their inner mental landscape into a tangible realm. This newly constructed realm is then infused with that individual's curse technique, thus allowing anyone who is trapped within that domain expansion to be utterly dominated by the curse technique. Each domain expansion is very unique and it's typically a reflection of the user's psyche. Each domain expansion is is triggered by a unique set of hand signs and no two domains are the same. In this video, I'm going to be going over every single domain expansion that's been revealed within Jujutsu Kaisen thus far. So we're going to be covering domain expansions from everybody from Kinji Hakari to Satoru Gojo and even Ryuman Sukuna. I'm super excited to talk about each of these domain expansions because each one reveals its users deepest fears, ambitions, as well as offering us a glimpse into the soul of these powerful characters. Make sure that you stick around until the very end of this video as I'll be explaining how domain expansions can alter the course of a fight, tipping the scales in a dramatic manner. So without further delay, here are all of the 13 domain expansions that have been revealed thus far within Jujutsu Kaisen. Discover the Undead Collection and be amongst the very first to join us on our journey over at Getsugard.com. Domain expansion is a high-level jujutsu technique only attainable to those who have reached the very top of their power as a sorcerer. Domain expansion involves the jujutsu sorcerer expanding their innate domain by utilizing their cursed energy to construct a separate space which is enclosed within a barrier. Now this barrier is not just a physical one because it is infused by the user's cursed technique. In order to activate a domain expansion, it requires a very unique hand sign or a signal which is specific specific to that Jujutsu Sorcerer. Visually, from the outside, a domain expansion appears to be a closed spherical barrier. Now, there are different types of domain expansions. Firstly, you have lethal domains. Now, these types are designed to be deadly as they serve to enhance the individual's curse technique to their highest potential. The barrier of a lethal domain expansion has a sure hit mechanism, ensuring that every attack within the domain makes contact with its target. Now, the downside with this type of domain is that constructing it demands immense skill and energy. So it's very rare that a lethal domain expansion is ever seen and it's only exclusive to the most skilled Jujutsu sorcerers. Now going back in time, domain expansions weren't always lethal. The very early examples of domain expansions had simply just enhanced the user's curse technique without the need to necessarily cause harm to anyone. An example of such a domain expansion is Hiromi Higuruma's Deadly Sentencing. This domain expansion pretty much manifests a courtroom trial instead of being a lethal domain expansion with a deadly physical attack. Now the third type of domain expansion is an incomplete domain. Now these are domains that either don't fully incorporate a user's curse technique into the barrier or they don't completely close the barrier of the domain expansion. Now incomplete domains still enhance their user's abilities but a downside to them is that they do not have the same short hit mechanism of a fully actualized lethal domain. As with any technique or transformation within shonen anime and manga, domain expansions have their own drawbacks and risks. For a jujutsu sorcerer to utilize a domain expansion, it takes a massive physical toll on their body, and it also consumes a vast amount of cursed energy. And more often than not, it can result in a temporary burnout of the individual's cursed techniques, thus making them unstable. In the most extreme of cases, as with Satoru Gojo and Sukuna, repeated use of their domain expansion and forcing the recovery of their curse techniques can result in lasting brain damage to areas of the brain which handle control over the domains, thus hindering the future use of their domain expansions. An example of this is seen within chapter 230 of the manga. Now it's difficult to the point of impossible to escape from an individual's domain expansion from the inside, but a jujutsu sorcerer can use anti-domain techniques like a simple domain or a hollow wicker basket 
which is able to neutralize the effects of somebody else's domain expansion. The most effective way to count for a domain is for a jujutsu sorcerer to expand their very own domain, thus leading to a domain clash where the most refined or powerful domain expansion ends up prevailing. Now if two domains overlap and are evenly matched, then the sure hit mechanism of the domain expansions may cancel each other out, and these clashes can also result in opportunities for an individual to escape from a domain or for one user to have a strategic advantage over the other. Okay, so now that we understand the very basic mechanisms of domain expansion, let's now dive into all of the different domain expansions which have been revealed within Jujutsu Kaisen thus far. The first domain that we'll be talking about is Coffin of the Iron Mountain, and this is Jogo's domain expansion. It makes his debut appearance within chapter 15 of the manga and in episode 7 of the Jujutsu Kaisen anime. Coffin of the Iron Mountain is a lethal domain expansion as it manifests as an environment which is similar to the inside of an active volcano. Now the features of this domain include a sealed stone chamber with large cuts and openings across the walls and the ground where huge amounts of magma can spout out from. Now the intense heat which is generated from this domain expansion is so extreme that it can cause the average Jujutsu sorcerer to combust immediately upon entry. While in his domain expansion, Jogo wields control over the environment, paying particular focus to the molten rock, allowing him to launch guaranteed hit attacks which are pretty much impossible to dodge. The sure hit advantage of his domain is crucial for overcoming the defenses of really strong opponents like Satoru Gojo. Jogo first utilizes his domain expansion during his desperate attempt to defeat Satoru Gojo during their battle. Despite all of the advantages of the Coffin of the Iron Mountain, it wasn't enough to stop Gojo from being able to protect himself and his student Yuji from both the heat of the domain as well as the attacks of Jogo. Now during this conflict, we see a domain clash where Gojo's own domain called Unlimited Void proves to be superior as it quickly overcomes Coffin of the Iron Mountain. This encounter pretty much traumatizes Jogo to the point where he is afraid of using his domain expansion against really powerful opponents like Sukuna in future encounters. Next up, we have the domain expansion, which I'm sure you're all hyped to hear about. This is Ryuma and Sukuna's domain expansion called Malevolent Shrine. This is another lethal domain expansion, and it makes its first appearance within chapter 8 of the manga and in episode 4 of the anime. Malevolent Shrine features a distorted, very eerie environment, which resembles a Buddhist shrine, and it is dedicated to demons rather than deities. The Malevolent Shrine is disfigured, with horns and human skulls decorating its roof, and the entrances are grotesque mouths with human-like teeth and tongues. This domain expansion allows Sukuna the ability to execute a relentless number of slashing attacks, which pretty much disintegrate anything within the effective range of the attack. Sukuna uses his cursed techniques called Cleave and Dismantle, as he can target entities based on their nature. He uses Cleave for those with cursed energy, and Dismantle for those who are using inanimate objects. Sukuna's domain expansion is effective without a closed barrier, so it does allow for an escape route for his targets, but in turn Sukuna is advantaged by the short hit mechanism which allows all of its attacks to hit their target within an insane range of 200 meters. We've seen Sukuna utilize Malevolent Shrine a handful of times. We had first seen its formidable power when Sukuna had used it to dismember a finger bearer, as well as in a later significant clash against Mahuraga within the Shubia incident arc. Here he had adjusted the range of his domain to focus his attacks on his target. Since then, this domain expansion has gained a lot of notoriety for its clash against Satoru Gojo's unlimited void. Sukuna's malevolent shrine proved that it was capable of breaking through Gojo's barrier due to its unique structure, as well as a combination of all of the strategic adjustments that Sukuna was making during his battle against Gojo. Now the next domain expansion is another incredible one as it's Satoru Gojo's Unlimited Void. This domain expansion makes his debut appearance within chapter 15 of the manga and in episode 7 of the anime. Unlimited Void represents Gojo's limitless technique as it creates an environment that mimics outer space decorated completely with a black hole, distant galaxies, as well as several white patches. Now the domain floods the target's mind with a boundless amount of raw information, thus rendering them completely immobile and being overwhelmed with all of the information that they are receiving. It's pretty much a sensory and cognitive overload. The overload 
mode of unlimited void is paradoxical, as targets experience everything and nothing at the same time, and this then results in them being completely incapacitated. The complete overload of unlimited void can affect anybody who is caught within his domain expansion, except for Gojo himself and anybody who is physically touching him. Gojo's domain expansion understandably is a almost guaranteed win due to its overwhelming and disorientating effect that it has on its target. Unlimited Void was one of the first domain expansions that we see within the series when Gojo had used it against Jogo. It was easily able to overwhelm Jogo's Coffin of the Iron Mountain domain expansion. Gojo uses Unlimited Void again during the Shibuya Incident arc when he had used a brief activation of his domain expansion to incapacitate a large number of transfigured humans without harming any of the bystanders nearby. This one act had demonstrated how much control Gojo has over his domain, as well as how he is able to strategically apply the effects of Unlimited Void in any given situation. During Gojo's battle against Sukuna, Unlimited Void was activated multiple times. Each time that he had activated his domain expansion, he had strategically made an adjustment in order to counter Sukuna's malevolent shrine. Despite the power of Gojo's domain, after having used it to repeatedly clash against Sukuna's domain, as well as the high energy required to use it, it had eventually led to Gojo being unable to sustain the activation of Unlimited Void. Now initially, when Gojo and Sukuna had activated their domain expansions, it was demonstrated that the two of them have equal refinement with their domains. However, thanks to Sukuna's strategic adjustments combined with the physical weakening of Gojo's domain barriers, it had eventually led to the collapse of Unlimited Void in future clashes. Despite this, both of their domains were shown to collapse at the same time on several occasions. This indicates that a massive level of power and tactical depth was being utilized by the two of them. Gojo vs Sukuna showcased to us the peak of Jujutsu Kaisen's power system, and what two incredibly powerful Jujutsu sorcerers are really capable of. Gojo was continuously adapting the internal and external conditions of Unlimited Void in order to protect it from attacks from Malevolent Shrine. He went as far as to minimize the size of the domain in order to increase the density and toughness of his domain barrier. By doing so, he showcased how much mastery he has over his domain's mechanics, as well as his high level of strategic thinking and his ability to easily adapt in any given battle scenario. During the final clash between Unlimited Void and Malevolent Shrine, we had seen a key moment where Gojo's faster activation time of his domain expansion had allowed him to temporarily immobilize Sukuna. By doing so, he was able to significantly injure Sukuna and thus cause the collapse of his domain. So in short, Unlimited Void is honestly one of the most incredible domain expansions in the entire series. And if you want to learn more about it, then check out my standalone video that I've done on Gojo vs Sukuna, where I dive in depth into this epic encounter. The next domain expansion is Mahito's titled Self Embodiment of Perfection. And this domain is derived from his cursed technique called Idol Transfiguration. Self Embodiment of Perfection makes his debut appearance within chapter 29 of the manga and in episode 13 of the anime. This domain is created by unique hand seals which are formed by tiny hands within Mahito's mouth, and they create a large black environment. This environment then creates giant hands which are formed together in a flower-like shape with multiple arms interconnected in a net-like pattern which surround the target. This domain expansion significantly enhances Mahito's ability idol transfiguration. It allows him to transfigure the souls of those who are within the domain expansion without the need of making physical contact with them. Mahito developed his domain expansion during a key moment in his battle against Nanami and Yuji. He had drawn inspiration from his near-death experience in order to unlock his powerful new ability. When it was activated, Mahito was able to isolate Nanami and thus initially lock Yuji out. However, Yuji's subsequent breach into the domain of Mahito had forced him to unintentionally touch the soul of Sukuna, thus leading to severe consequences for Mahito. Later, Mahito demonstrated the ability to activate his domain for a mere 0.2 seconds, which he had used effectively against Yuji and Aoi Todo. So instead of separately activating his domain expansion and then using his curse technique, he had streamlined this all into one singular process. Moving on, we now have the Chimera Shadow Garden, which is the domain expansion of Megumi Fushiguro. This domain is derived from his Ten Shadows curse technique. It makes its first appearance within chapter 
58 of the manga and in episode 23 of the anime. Chimera Shadow Garden is characterized by its creation of a dense, fluid shadow environment that floods the entire surroundings. Now this shadow not only recolors the space into a negative color palette, but it also includes several large conjured objects which resemble spinal bone columns which are decorated with bow-shaped ropes as well as roots. This domain is notable for its ability to manifest multiple Shikigami, thus enabling Megami to have an advanced level of manipulation over shadows. Chimera Shadow Garden allows Megami to significantly enhance his 10 shadows technique. Within this shadowy realm, he can rapidly create and manipulate Shikigami like black toads as well as multiple versions of new that can attack opponents swiftly from various different angles. The shadows that he conjures and controls can also reshape themselves to facilitate Megami's movements. In one such example, the ground which is covered in shadows can quickly reshape itself into black toads, which instantly grab onto Megami's opponent, and Megami is also able to surf using these toads in order to move across the large number of shadows that have been manifested at high levels of speed. Megami had first utilized his domain expansion during a very desperate battle, where he had almost utilized all of his cursed energy. As a result, the domain expansion that he conjured was incomplete and it lacked a full barrier, as well as the short hit mechanism of a domain expansion. Despite this, his domain was still significantly able to boost his 10 shadows technique. During the Shibuya incident arc, Megami had utilized this domain creatively in order to penetrate Dagon's more refined domain, thus setting up a strategic domain clash. Megami had used his domain primarily for defensive purposes. He had later allowed Maki to access all of the weapons within his shadows, thus proving that his domain has further utility beyond just straightforward combat, as it can be used to stall a large number of weaponry. During another critical moment within the Culling Games arc, Megami had adapted the environment of a gymnasium to forcibly enclose his domain around his opponent, Reggie. Now, his domain is still incomplete and it is lacking its short hit mechanism. The domain was still able to boost Megami's 10 shadows technique to 120% of its power, thus allowing Megami to generate clones and utilize the increased shadow manipulation effectively against his target. As I've mentioned several times, the incomplete nature of Chimera's Shadow Garden means that it lacks the guaranteed hit effect that is typical of more refined domains. The activation of this domain expansion strains Megami physically, and this is evidenced by the nosebleeds and significant energy depletion that he has. Megami's strategic use of his domain compensates for its incompleteness, as he uses his domain instead to amplify his 10 shadows technique, utilizing it for him to have a tactical advantage rather than simply relying on the domain expansion for direct attacks. Now, one of the shorter and less detailed domain expansions belongs to a smallpox deity. This is a graveyard domain as the smallpox deity uses its fingers to craft hand signs in order to activate the domain. Once activated, the graveyard domain traps its target within a coffin and it buries it beneath a gravestone. Following this, a countdown to the number three begins and after three seconds, the target will then be infected with the smallpox disease and die. The domain of the smallpox deity is not to be underestimated as it also has a short hit mechanism. This was demonstrated when Meimei was struggling to deal with it as she was repeatedly being trapped under a gravestone. Following this, we have Horizon of the Captivating Sekunda. This is the domain expansion of Dagon. It makes his debut appearance within chapter 16 of the manga and in episode 7 of the anime. This domain conjures a tranquil, tropical beach setting, complete with a forest of palm trees and one shore with an expansive ocean on the other side. This domain has been noted for its peaceful ambience and the shallow waters near to the beach allow for very easy standing. This domain specializes in launching short hit attacks through Shikigami that Dagon conjures. These Shikigami materialize instantaneously at the location of his target, thus making them nearly impossible to block or to avoid, as they don't exist until the moment that they strike. These Shikigami are able to devour into the flesh of a target upon making their appearance. Dagon initially used this domain as a cursed womb, creating a relaxed beach-like environment within an apartment for himself and his companions to unwind and relax. After evolving into a fully developed cursed spirit, Dagon used his domain in combat scenarios, such as during the battle in Shibuya against sorcerers like Nanami, Maki, and Naobito. Within Horizon of the Captivating Sekunda, 
Dagon had deployed his Shikigami in order to effortlessly attack and overpower his opponents. However, the effectiveness of his domain was challenged when Megami had entered into his domain with his very own domain, thus leading to a domain clash which had negated Dagon's short hit advantage. This was further exploited by Toji Fushiguro who had breached the domain and had used his lack of cursed energy in order to launch a fatal attack on Dagon which had ultimately resulted in the collapse of Dagon's domain. We're on to one of my favourite domain expansions and it's Deadly Sentencing which belongs to Hiromi Higuruma. This is a non-lethal domain expansion which makes its debut appearance within chapter 164 of the manga. Deadly Sentencing transforms the environment into a courtroom setting where Hiromi Higuruma and his opponent assume the roles of prosecutor and defendant respectively. The setting of this domain includes multiple guillotines and debris symbolising the gravity of the trial process. This domain expansion explicitly forbids violence and it focuses instead on a judicial process which is governed by the user's cursed technique. Death sentencing does not employ a guaranteed hit mechanism but it does ensure that all participants strictly adhere to the rules of Higuruma's cursed technique. Deadly sentencing executes a trial where a shikigami named Judgeman serves as the judge announcing charges and thus overseeing the proceedings. Judgeman possesses complete knowledge of the individuals within the domain, though it does not share this information with Higuruma. When this domain expansion is activated, the trial begins immediately. Defendants are given options to either stay silent, confess, or to deny charges. The defendant's response will thus influence the outcome of the trial. Higuruma, acting as the prosecutor, presents a rebuttal based on evidence provided in a sealed envelope by Judgeman. The final verdict of the trial is delivered by Judgeman, and it can result in various different outcomes based on the strengths of the arguments presented as well as the perceived severity of the alleged crimes. We have had two sentences carried out within the story. The first had resulted in confiscation. This disables the defendant's ability to use cursed techniques, or if they lack the ability to use cursed techniques, then their cursed energy is disabled. The second sentencing is much more severe, as it's a combination of confiscation and death penalty. This is where the defendant is disarmed of their cursed techniques, and the prosecutor is granted the executioner's sword, which is capable of killing the opponent with a single strike. Within the story, there have been two notable times that death sentencing has been used. The first is during Yuji Itadori's trial, where he was accused of unlawful entry into a pachinko parlor. Yuji initially faces a sentence of confiscation, but after demanding a retrial where he is wrongly accused of mass murder during the Shibuya incident, the trial results in a death sentence, which is later revoked by Higuruma upon realization of Yuji's innocence. The second trial is against Sukuna. In a strategic move, Higuruma includes Sukuna as a co-defendant to leverage the domain's rules against him. After a misinterpretation of the domain expansion's rules, it leads to an unexpected outcome. Higuruma's domain expansion is unique as it leverages his background as a lawyer and it creates a battlefield that relies on legal wit rather than physical strength. The effectiveness of this domain is dependent upon the user's ability to manipulate the trial's proceedings as well as the accuracy of the evidence that is presented by Judgeman. Now it's time to talk about Time Cell Moon Palace and this is the domain expansion of Naoya Zenning. This is a lethal type domain expansion and it makes its first appearance within chapter 198 of the manga. Time Cell Moon Palace creates a dark empty space scattered with floating particles and it's centered around a straight path of flesh which leads up to a massive eye which is located behind the caster of the domain. The main feature of this domain domain is its automatic hit mechanism, which forcefully injects film-like animation frames into the neck of its target. Now movement within the domain must adhere to the 24 frames per second rule of projection sorcery. 24 frames per second is pretty much the frame rate of any typical anime. Now failure to follow these rules results in severe bodily injuries which immobilizes the target. The domain's precise targeting can freeze individual cells, thus causing extensive damage and even dismemberment if the opponent is forced to move. Naoya Zanin had first used this domain against Maki Hagane Daido and Rokujushi Mio. This was during a desperate fight as Naoya Zanin had appeared as a vengeful cursed spirit. He had trapped Daido and Mio, thus inflicting severe injuries through his domain's auto-hit mechanism. However, Maki possessing no cursed energy was unaffected by the domain and thus was able to ultimately defeat Naoya. Following this, we have the domain expansion 
mention Threefold Affliction. This belongs to Yorozu and it makes its debut appearance within chapter 219 of the manga. Threefold Affliction creates a domain which manifests as a largely blank space which is dotted with oversized organic structures floating within it. Now these structures resemble the disembodied brains and ventral nerve cords of insects and this adds to the unsettling atmosphere of the domain. The short hit mechanism within this domain specifically applies to Yorozu's constructed items, ensuring that her creations within the domain have enhanced efficacy and they cannot miss their intended targets. Yorozu used her domain towards the end of her battle with Sukuna. This was immediately after constructing her most formidable weapon, which was the True Sphere. Now, if everything had worked out, then the domain was supposed to guarantee that the True Sphere would hit Sukuna. But because Yorozu had hesitated to activate her curse technique because of Sukuna's unfazed demeanor, this hesitation had proved costly as Sukuna ended up summoning Mahoraga, which not only withstood all of her attacks due to its prior adaptation, but it also destroyed the True Sphere with its Sword of Extermination. In the end, Mahoraga ended up defeating Yorozu, thus leading to the collapse of her domain. Following this, we have the domain expansion of Yuta Okotsu called Authentic Mutual Love. Now, this domain makes its debut appearance within chapter 249 of the manga. Authentic Mutual Love creates a battlefield which replicates a wreckage with cross-shaped structures and numerous katanas, and they're all encircled by decorative Japanese cards. Now, this domain enables Yuta to select one of his copied curse techniques and to imbue it into the barrier of the domain, and thus this curse technique then becomes the guaranteed hit effect of the domain. And meanwhile, his backlog of curse techniques are randomly assigned to the katanas that are located throughout the domain. Yuta is the only one who is able to activate the curse techniques within these swords, and so each sword is single use and it's destroyed after its technique is used, although they do appear in an unlimited number. Yuta had first utilized this domain during the end of his battle at the Sendai Colony, and this was in response to domains expanded by Ryu Ishiguro and Takaku Uro. All of the overlapping domains as well as the external interference had resulted in all of the domains involved collapsing prematurely. During Yuta's encounter with Sukuna, he had fully demonstrated the capabilities of his domain, as he initially had handicapped Sukuna by forcing him to maintain hollow wicker basket in order to neutralize the domain's short sure hit effect. Yuta had imbued Angel's technique extinguishment into the domain, as he had then also strategically used a katana which was imbued with Takako's innate technique which was coupled with Thin Icebreaker in order to inflict damage on Sukuna's face. Later in his fight with Sukuna, Yuta had utilized a sword which had contained Durov Lakdawala's technique to form Shikigami that can create an absolute slashing barrier. He had also used a sword with cursed speech to immobilize Sukuna, preventing him from attacking Yuji. Yuta's ability to adapt within any combat scenario showcases his strategic prowess as well as his ability to predict and counter Sukuna's movements. Yuta eventually used a sword with Sukuna's own cleave technique against him, which was honestly so hype inducing to behold. We're almost at the end now and this is a domain expansion which I know you've all been waiting to hear about and it's Idol Death Gamble which obviously belongs to Kinji Hakari and it's a non-lethal domain expansion which makes its first appearance within chapter 180 of the manga. Idol Death Gamble is inspired by a real-life pachinko machine and the romance manga series which is titled Private Pure Love Train. It simulates a game environment where the key is to hit a jackpot by aligning three identical symbols which represent characters from the manga series. The domain has the unique ability to transfer all of the game rules directly into the opponent's mind through its short hit mechanism. So the target is aware of what's going to happen but they are unable to alter the flow of the game. The domain has a couple of capabilities. The first is to power up the user's cursed energy and more importantly the ability to perform an automatic reverse curse technique. The second capability of the domain is to enhance regeneration speed surpassing that of even Gojo and Sukuna and it allows the user of the domain to become virtually unkillable for the duration of the theme song Admiring You. This plays for 4 minutes and 11 seconds upon hitting the jackpot. So Idol Death Gamble begins in a neutral stage and it progresses through various scenarios called Ricci scenarios. Now these use visual
visual effects like shutter doors, reverse balls, and consecutive effects in order to manipulate the game's outcome. These visual indicators have different chances of leading to a jackpot, and it's based entirely on color rarity, as the colors that appear could either be green, red, or gold. Now, there are three Ricci scenarios. The first is Transit Card Ricci. Now, this is a low chance scenario, and it's dependent upon the manga character Yuki passing through a station gate on time. The second Ricci scenario is Potty Emergency Ricci. Now, this is a medium chance scenario, and it's successful if the manga character Hiro reaches a station without an accident. Now, the third Ricci scenario is Friday Night Final Train Ricci. This is a high chance scenario, and success happens if the character Yume misses her train. So, if a jackpot is hit, then the domain grants the user unlimited cursed energy, and it initiates the rapid regeneration of any injuries for the duration of the theme song of the manga series. Now, failure to achieve a jackpot resets the stage to its starting point, and thus reducing the number of remaining attempts. Hakari had first utilized his domain Idol Death Gamble during his battle against Charles Bernard within the Tokyo Number no. 2 colony. Despite the immersive and very detailed nature of this domain, it primarily serves to support Hakari's own combat abilities through enhanced cursed energy and regeneration, thus allowing him to survive and to continue fighting even after he sustains severe injuries. Now, the final domain expansion that I'm listing is Kenjaku's Womb Perfusion, which makes its debut appearance within chapter 205. Womb Perfusion manifests itself as a massive totem of grotesque cursed spirit-like faces which are merged together. This domain is known for the explosive force that it generates during attacks, and it's reminiscent of a direct hit from the technique Maximum Uzumaki. The precise nature of the attacks from this domain are not detailed, but they are characterized by their insane impact, as well as how they are guaranteed to hit their target within this domain. Kenjaku had first used Wound Perfusion in a fight against Yuki Tsukumo. Kenjaku ended up exploiting her hesitation to open her domain. Kenjaku's domain expansion does not rely on a fully enclosed barrier, thus allowing Wound Perfusion to operate with a more fluid and less defined boundary. This particular attribute of the domain had made it difficult for Master Tengen to target and dismantle it. Despite the open structure of the domain, its power was sufficient to dismantle Yuki's domain quickly, and it was also able to inflict severe injuries through a powerful blast wave. Master Tengen eventually managed to dispel Wound Perfusion by targeting targeting the edge of the area affected by its can't miss attacks. So that was all of the 13 domain expansions which we have been shown within Jujutsu Kaisen thus far. Chapter 258 is the most latest chapter that has been released as of making this video, so if there are in fact any future domain expansions which have yet to be revealed, then I'll definitely be making an update to this video. I'd love for all of you to continue the discussion in the comments, let me know all of your favorite domain expansions, and how you would rank them in terms of power. I have had so much fun talking about all of these different domain expansions, and if you've enjoyed me talking about Jujutsu Kaisen, then let me know by leaving a comment under this video, and if you want to see more Jujutsu Kaisen content from this channel. Lastly, thanks for making it to the end of this video, and I cannot wait to see you in my next Jujutsu Kaisen Explained video. A massive thank you goes out to all of my amazing Patreon supporters for helping to make this video possible. If you also want to support the channel and see your name in the end of my videos, then check out my Patreon which has loads of perks like early video access and so much more. Thank you for sticking around till the end of the video and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.